أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ياسين والقرآن الحكيم إنك لمن المرسلين على صراط تنزين العزيز الرحيم لتنذر قوما ما أنذر آباؤهم فهم غافلون لقد حق القول على أكثرهم فهم لا يؤمنون إن وجعلنا من بين أيديهم سدا ومن خلفهم سدا فأغشيناهم فهم لا يبصرون وسواء عليهم أأنذرتهم أم لم تنذرهم لا يؤمنون إنما تنذر من اتبع الذكر وخشي فبشروا بمغفرة وأجر كريم إنا نحن نحيي الموتى ونكتب ما قدموا وآثارهم وكل شيء أحصيناه في إمام مبين واضرب لهم مثلا أصحاب القرية إذ جاء أرسلنا إليهم اثنين فكذبوهما فعززنا بثالث فقالوا فقالوا إنا إليكم مرسلون قالوا ما أنتم إلا بشر مثلنا وما لنرجمنكم وليمسنكم منا عذاب أليم قالوا طائركم معكم أئن ذكرتم بل أنتم قوم مسرفون وجاء من أقصى المدينة رجل يسعى قال يا قوم اتبعوا المرسلين اتبعوا من لا يسألكم أجرا وهم مهتدون وما لي لا أعبد الذي فطرني وإليه ترجعون أأتخذ من فاسمعون قيل ادخل الجنة قال يا ليت قومي يعلمون 
بما غفر لي ربي وجعلني من المكرمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome back to the Realist Podcast in the Dunya the three Muslims today, we are joined with a very esteemed guest. He's a PhD in biblical Islamic hermeneutics and the speaker of three different languages, not just any languages, but some maybe of the most difficult languages to learn and speak. That is Hebrew, Greek, and uh, Arabic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Dr. Ali Atai. How are you doing today? Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, brother? How's it going? Alhamdulillah, tamam, tamam. This has been a, a long time coming. We saw you on uh, Blogging Theology. You've done a lot of great work and great presentations on there. So I suggest everyone check that out, inshallah. And we've been trying to make this happen for uh, for a hot minute now. So it's a blessing, mm-hmm. alhamdulillah, to have you here. Um, as a young man who's uh, discussed with many, many Christians and, um, you know, people who will always reference the Bible, I have many, many questions for you. So I hope you're ready, inshallah, for all that. We'll do our best, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah, bismillah uh, ar-Rahim. And everyone in the comments, feel free to send your co- questions forward. But just to begin, I want to know a little bit about your your background. Not so much your educational background, but maybe more so your upbringing and why you decided to get into the field that you you, you studied. Yeah, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Muhammadin wa alaihi wa sahbihi jama'in. So um, I don't know. I've I've just always sort of been interested in in uh, discovering the truth, um, keeping an open mind. You know, um, I was born in Iran and many Iranians who <laughs> came to America uh, are very secular, right? Not very religious, I would say. Uh, so um, most of my friends growing up, I grew up in the East Bay of California. Most of them were, uh, were Christian. They were, they were white. Um, they, um, they took me to their churches. Uh, they tried to convert me. I would say at the time, um, I didn't really subscribe to any one religion. Uh, I was just sort of interested in, in different sort of belief systems. Uh, so I attended uh, multiple churches, uh, even a Mormon Sunday school for a couple of years, actually. Uh, and, and they had, mashallah, they had immaculate adab. <laughs> they're, they're very moral people, right? Um, but when I got older, I looked into their theology and I said, whoa, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on with this theology? Um, so none of that sort of stuck with me. Um, none of it sort of resonated with me. Now I did, you know, I was, I've, I've been studying the New Testament. I've been reading the New Testament since I was in elementary school or grammar school, whatever you guys call it up in, up in Canada. Um, and uh, so I kind of fell in love with, with uh, Isa alayhi salam before I knew anything about the prophets of Allah right? Um, but the... The theology of Christianity, right? Um, it just, I just found it so strange. I found it odd. Um, I didn't understand it. Um, I tried to understand it, and I had it explained to me uh, multiple times by uh, my friends, my peers, by adults, by pastors. Um, the Trinity to me just was something that was uh, just uh, something that I could not penetrate at all. You know, and I thought, well, this this isn't working. So when I was in college, um, when I started college at 17, um, I was uh, I took an intro to business class and uh, the, the, the uh, professor put us in alphabetical order in the class. And I noticed that this uh, this guy behind me, he had the same last name as I did. Uh, so I asked him, are, are you Iranian? And he said, no, I'm Afghan. I said, OK. And then he said, uh, are you Muslim? And I, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm Muslim. And I had, you know, sort of um, been converted by, I guess you could say by Malcolm X um, when I was 15 years old. Uh, so I started to call myself Muslim. I didn't know how to practice or anything. So I had not met like practicing Muslims until I got to college. I said, he told me about the, the, the MSA and he took me there. Um, and uh, so I went there and uh, I started to really uh, you know, study Islamic theology. Um, I mean, it, at the time, at a very basic level. But to my surprise, Muslims believe in Jesus, right? And that's something I needed to hold on to because, like I said, I sort of fell in love with with Jesus from from the from the Bible, right? 
but but the theology didn't stick with it. So, and then I discovered that, yeah, we can I can believe in Jesus, um, but I don't have to believe in the Trinity. I don't have to believe mm. in God, and I, but I can still love him. And so um, I came to this realization that basically the, uh, the, this teaching, our Christology about Christ, peace be upon him, right? Our belief about Jesus, peace be upon him, is given through the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he is the sort of means of our guidance. Uh, so then I started to appreciate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, I started to learn about the Prophet, studying the Sirah, um, engaging in the Shama'il of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and immediately, you know, fell in love with him. Uh, and he became the most beloved of human beings to me. Um, and, and so that's, that's sort of the, uh, the story in a nutshell. Wow, subhanAllah. So when do you think you, you really made a, a smooth transition to, you know, I'm Muslim kind of, I'm saying I'm Muslim to, wow, I am Muslim? Yeah, I, I think it was, um, I think it was uh, when uh, I first attended um, like classes of, 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 of sacred knowledge, right? So, when, yeah, when I was 15, I saw this movie, Malcolm X, right? Mm -hmm. I actually remember the date. The exact date is November 18th, 1992. Wow. I, I was four days short of my 15th birthday. And so my dad, for, for no, no apparent reason, I don't know why, he just said, let's go watch this movie, Malcolm X. And I thought to myself, yeah, I've heard of Malcolm X, but I don't know why he wants to watch this movie. So I said, okay, I'll, let's go with him. And so I was sitting there, and, I, and to be honest with you, I was bored for about the first two hours. Uh, and then, um, you know, he, he goes to Hajj and there was something about, I don't know, like something about the, the way that those scenes were filmed, you know, Spike Lee was a director, uh, that just resonated with me deeply. Uh, and then I was kind of just sitting there in the movie theater, kind of just dumbstruck, just kind of staring at the screen. And I actually sat through all of the credits, you know, and at the end of the credits, he actually they show the, uh, a picture, an image of the autobiography of Malcolm X. Mm. So I looked at that, and I kind of took a mental picture. I went to, the, I went to my local library over here, uh, and I checked it out, and I took it home, and I started to read it, and it's, it's very thick, and at the time, I mean, I'm 14 years old, almost 15. So then I went to the chapter on Hajj. Uh, after I read that chapter, I remember I closed the book, and I said, okay, I'm Muslim. I just made it up in my mind that I'm going to be Muslim. I didn't know anything about the practice of Islam. That didn't come until about three or two or three years later when I actually attended. Um, I was about 18 years old. So Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, who is the president of, of our college, Zaytuna, he was teaching a class on Maliki fiqh. Um, um, and so uh, I went there and I, I didn't know what Maliki was. I don't know what fiqh is. <laughs> But I, I just, I was just watching him, and I was just completely, just, just floored by, you know, his demeanor, his knowledge. You know, I remember he started writing in Arabic on the board, and I said, "Wow, this is mind blowing! He can, he can, he can write Arabic." Uh, <laughs> uh, and so, uh, I, from that point on, I said, "Okay, I need to learn this religion. I need to start practicing uh, this religion." So that was the sort of turning point for me. So these two men, really, Malcolm X and Sheikh Hamza, really. <clears throat> and me sort of embracing the religion wholeheartedly. Wow. wow Not a lot. Nothing happens by coincidence. You know, it's, it's times like this when you look back and we all have these moments where it's kind of similar to your father taking you to the movies, you know? And it's not until way later that you, you put together the pieces and realize that everything happens for a reason. I know like a lot of non-Muslims, they call it the butterfly effect. We call it the color of Allah. But Allah plans in the most perfect ways possible. SubhanAllah. MashaAllah. Yeah. yeah. Alhamdulillah. So, and eventually there, I think, got a point where you just, you know, really, really leveled up. So would you say it was mm -hmm. at some point during studying, you know, uh, and achieving your PhD or after you achieved it where you got to this level where it's like, you know, wow, you know, this is Dr. Ali Atai. He's on blogging theology. He's super knowledgeable. He speaks three languages. That's a big one. Like speaking three languages. Is this a part of your PhD? Well, I mean... I would say I only really speak English, right? I mean, <laughs> you can tell what, what language do you dream in? What language do you cuss in? <laughs> That's really your, your main language. Uh, so yeah, I have an academic understanding of these other languages. 
I've always been interested in language. Uh, like I said, you know, I, I grew up sort of reading the Bible. And, but I wanted to know, like, what the actual text says. I don't like translations. So what does the text actually say in its original language? Yeah. Uh, so it, it was more, um, yeah, I, I officially sort of learned these languages um, in graduate school, but uh, I, I studied them independently to a certain extent as much as I could uh, before that time. You know, kind of taught myself the Greek alphabet and the, the Hebrew alphabet and, um, you know, started to read Arabic a little bit. Uh, but it wasn't, yeah, it's my formal studies in graduate school where I started to engage in these languages. And, and it's really important to do that, you know. You know, sometimes, um, you know, people char characterize me as sort of being, you know, anti-Christian or anti-biblical and things like that. But I've invested so many years of my life to studying the Bible. It's because I respect it as a text. And I really want to know, you know, the history of this text. Um, you know, there's a lot of Muslim apologists who will attack the Bible and, you know, sort of deconstruct it, but they haven't really done a lot of studies in, in the Bible. Um, and so, um, you know, I encourage people that if you're going to criticize a text, uh, to do it academically, to do it with a, with a, uh, with a um, obviously with a good intention, but in a way that sort of reflects a sophistication and, and an actual attitude of respect for the text. So yeah, I've studied this text for, for many, many you know, years um, because I honestly want to know the truth. You know, I want to know what's going on with this book, what's going on with these gospels, who's Paul, you know, um, you know what's, who wrote the Old Testament? When was it you know, sort of canonized? Um, what do these words actually mean in Greek and Hebrew? Uh, so for me, you know, it's, uh, you know, and the Bible also is, it's, it's easily the most influential text in the history of Western civilization. You know, as, as Mark Van Doren uh, said in Liberal Education, he said, if, if, if you don't know uh, the Bible, if you don't know who Abraham, Moses, and David are, then you've been miseducated. You know, we, and we're Muslims living in the West. We, we need to know this text. We don't have to be experts. But we have to know something, right? Um, because the Quran does engage with the Bible. The Quran, I would say, in many cases, expects you to know the subtexts of many of its ayat, right? Because the Quran is engaging with biblical tradition, uh, with tradition of the late antique. You know, the sort of backstory uh, is taken for granted. We have to know what's going on with the Quran. Um, we have to know what's going on with the Bible in order to understand some of the, the stories of the Quran. Uh, we can get into some of that uh, later if you want, but it's it's you know it's I would say it's part and parcel of our tradition as Muslims to engage a little bit with with biblical history, because you know before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Bani Israel, they were the Muslim Ummah, right? They were the people of Wahi. They were the people that were given al Anbiya. You know, so um, it it behooves us to to study these texts and these traditions in order to understand our own tradition. I think I think that's very briefly said because a lot of the time and you'll see this on apps that are kind of all, all over the place like TikTok, you know, people just two young people jumping on a live together and yelling at each other. A Muslim will say horrible things and Christian will say horrible things and none of them really seem to, to care. Um, I think academically is too gracious of a word to use. I don't think they care about, you know, even the discussion on a very basic human level. So I think it's important um, to ask this and then I think we can get to the, the, the specifics later. I, myself, and I, I think many others are wondering, what is the best way for a Muslim to interact with the Christian in 2023? Mm. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, you know, uh, we have a lot in common with, with Christianity. And I would say Islam is, by its nature, you know, conservative. We have, we have conservative values. We believe in family values, right? We believe in human nature. <laughs> We believe that human nature informs, if you want to call them gender roles, you know, uh, the word gender wasn't, you know, actually used for human beings until the 20th century. We have, we have, there are two sexes, right? But if, if they want to use that type of language, we believe in, uh, you know, objective truth with a capital T, you know, um, we're close here to UC Berkeley. Their school motto is, uh, you know, Fiat Lux, let there be light from the Bible. Right, that's from Genesis. You have other schools 
uh, Luke's at Veritas, right, light and truth. But these other schools, they don't they don't teach traditional religion. They don't they don't teach truth with a capital T, right? Um, because that's seen as you know archaic and antiquated and offensive and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but Christians who hold on to their tradition, right? We have a lot in common with them. Um, and uh, certainly in the face of the current zeitgeist, which is totally anti-religious and anti-tradition and really anti-truth. I mean, you can make your own truth, right? Uh, everyone has their own truth. I mean, you hear this a lot. I'm going to live my truth. Well, there's only one truth, mm. right? And that's, and that's what we believe. And so the Quran, you know, what does the Quran say? Let the people of the gospel, you know, um, judge by what Allah has revealed therein. This doesn't mean, I mean, some Christians, they, they quote these verses and they say, this verse means the Bible is completely uh, um, accurate and, 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 and perfect. And, no, I mean, the, the Quran, and this, this is what we want. We want Christians to follow their tradition, right? This is, this is good for... This is good for the world that they follow their traditions because there is truth in their tradition and they believe in objective truth and they believe in objective morality. Whereas you look at what's happening right now in our society, it's a total jungle, right? Mm -hmm. So certainly we have a lot in common. So I would say that, you know, when we engage with Christians, obviously we have to do it with Adam, you know, and, you know, for me, you know, you know, when I was an undergraduate, we had this, we had this Thursday night, um, farmer's market where, you know, I went to school in the central coast of California, and that's known as sort of the California Bible Belt. You know, California does have a Bible Belt. Uh, so we would go out to the street, we make all the, we debate all these Christians, and thank God, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that none of those things are, this is pre-internet, pre-YouTube, none of that stuff is on, is on, uh, is online, you know, um, because, you know, debating is very difficult. And, you know, I wonder, like, some of these guys that go out and they debate people in the street and they post them on YouTube, you know, when they turn 40, I think they're going to regret um, most of what they what they posted, right? Why do you think that is? I think that's interesting. Why, why do you think that is? It's, you know, de debate, jigal, right? This is an art form. You really need to have incredible adab, you know? It's, you almost have to completely mm -hmm. remove your ego, uh, from that, right? Because you have to really have, a, you know, obviously a very sincere intention for the guidance of the other person. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Quran tells us how to how to debate, right? How to engage with people. Right? So when we engage with people, Ahl uh, Kitab, in debate, we have to do it with not only like dalail, like you know, basically like proofs. Um, um, you know, scriptural proofs, historical proofs, etc., theological proofs, but also with good comportment, with a good attitude, uh, with a sincere intention for the guidance of the other person. And it's very hard to do that. The ego gets involved, especially if, you know, there's a camera there and you have followers. And uh, I think it's just almost impossible uh, unless someone is very, very disciplined, right, with years of training, Right, people forget the inward sciences. They have to study these things. To see you to nafs is very, very important. So I tell you a true story. What happened to me is I was at one of these debates. I was, you know, 21 years old or something, and I used to go out there and, you know, just completely annihilate these these poor Christian guys. Um, you know, and, and uh, I look back at it, and actually, it turns my face red just thinking about what I used to say to them. But I used to go out there and do that, and um, I remember. <laughs> I remember, you know, the brother was talking about like Allah, you know, he does things and, you know, um, uh, according to his plan that, you know, we should take, uh, uh, we should, we should heed. So I was there and this older Christian guy was there and he was listening to me and he said to me, he just said, you don't care about us. You don't care about our guidance. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And he said, you just, you just want to come here and embarrass us. And of course I said, no, you can't, you know, you can't answer my questions and that's a cop out and this and that, you know. And then I went back to my dorm room and I literally had like an existential crisis because I'm just sitting there and I said, he's right. This is all nuffs, right? Uh, <laughs> I was honest with myself. 
And so I said, look, okay, I'm going to do this the right way. I'm going to actually study the Bible. I'm going to study its history. I'm going to study its languages. I'm going to renew my intention and actually try to engage with the Christians in a way that is according to the ethos of, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he called people to Islam, he did it with, uh, with great concern for them, right? And, you know, this is, this is something that is known in our, in our tradition, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had incredible concern for the guidance of his people. Yeah. Uh, and the day of Ta'if, for example, when the angel came and said to him, um, you know, if, give me the, uh, the okay, basically, and, you know, we'll destroy the city of Ta'if. And he said, no, I have hope in their descendants. Wow. And his only concern that day was, you know, what is his sort of, what is Allah's opinion of him, right? If this is happening to me and you are uh, not angry with me, فَلَأُبَالِي, then I don't mind, let it happen. Right? His only concern was Allah's opinion of him, not the opinion of the people. Mm. Right? But it's, it's a you know it's it's a difficult thing to do, you know. So, um, but yeah, I mean, we should talk about things we have in common with with Christians, as we have a lot of things in common, especially nowadays. Uh, but we also have differences, and those differences matter, right? So you know, we're not going to say that it doesn't matter. It's you know two sides of the same coin. It doesn't you know it, you know. Uh, whether you're reading uh, Ghazali or Aquinas, it's just sort of semantics. No, we're not saying that either. There are real differences between these religions. Uh, but in face of the current zeitgeist, we can certainly come together with Christians and voice our opinions as to, you know, just sort of uh, advocating a modicum of, of, of sanity in the world, that there is truth, there is falsehood, there, is, there, is, there are things that are moral, there is a man, there is a woman, these things are... <laughs> I mean, we knew these things not too long ago, but apparently... Uh, we've, we've spiraled into a type of chaos. <laughs> yeah, may Allah protect us from it. Um, and I really love the point you made um, before about sincerity. I at one point I was, I was supposed to give a speech, so I was thinking about, um, you know, how the Prophet really transformed the Sahaba. Because you can argue, yeah, you know, they're like our Shaykh, for example, they help transform the youth sometimes, but a lot of the time, not to the the degree the Prophet Sallam did. The Prophet Sallam he made like people who hated each other love each other come together as one and really just literally conquer the earth eventually down you know some generations that is tremendous and if we as especially as muslims don't study how he did that then we are you know we're we're, we're falling behind greatly i'd say so i was looking into what was it that he had and i i just came to the conclusion that he just actually cared about them he really just cared about them he was sincere in it and and you know he didn't just teach them islam and the quran he genuinely loved them. He genuinely wanted the best for them to the point where he said, Oh, Allah strengthened Islam with, you know, one of the two Umars, either Umar ibn Hisham, who was Abu Jahl, or Umar ibn Khattab, who at the time was also an enemy of Islam. You know, he made dua for both of them. And he said, Ya Allah, whichever, whoever you love more. And then Umar mm -hmm. anhu accepted Islam shortly after that. So he really just cared about people. So I think that's a beautiful point that no matter who we're speaking with, maybe even, you know, uh, big names like uh, Islamophobic names like David Wood and and Ridvan and these people, I think there has to be at least some of us who genuinely you know care for their guidance potentially, whether they accept it or not is up to them. But you know, yeah. Harisun alaykum, right? And Harisun alaykum in this ayah in Surah Al Tawbah, the ulama say this is am, this is a a uh, a, a concern the Prophet sallallahu had for the whole of humanity. Bil Now he has a special concern for the believers. But there is a concern for the whole of humanity that he had, right? And, and you're right. I mean, if, if we don't want people to be guided, if we want the destruction of people, right? I mean, I, I, I debated David Wood in 2006 or seven, something like that. I, I, I make do offer him, you know, I, I honestly want his guidance. I don't want his destruction. I want him to be guided. Um, and uh, that's, I think that is a perfect ethos. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all these people now you know it's uh it's difficult when you know we have to be we have to be very discriminatory as to who we engage with though i think that's important because according to the quran we're not even supposed to platform like mustahziun people who mock and deride our religion people who mock and insult the prophet right mm -hmm. um the quran says allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that i will take care of the mustahziun i will suffice you uh, as against them Right. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue 
to pray for people who do that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can can change the hearts, you know. Uh, and as you said, uh, Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, I mean, he had the most evil intention in the history of humanity. He had resolved upon the most evil intention in the history of humanity, which is to go kill the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah changed his heart. You know? yeah. So um, Allah is in charge of everything. You know, but yeah, I mean, we have to have we have to have, we have to have this type of prophetic concern for people. It's very very important uh, to do that. Yeah. Do you think that a lot of people that are either students of knowledge or they're trying to take a scholarly route and become more learned in Islamic sciences, they lack understanding the importance of adab and etiquette today? I think yeah, I think that's the the sort of according to our scholars, this is the the crisis of the modern world: the lack of adab. Right, a lack of adab, a lack of discipline. Discipline's a good word. You know, the word disciple and discipline are are linked, right? Mm-hmm. So the the uh, the person of adab, right, is 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 the educated person, but also the the virtuous uh, person. You know, and nowadays uh, I would say there's an epidemic of of, of people who lack uh, adab. Um, a lot of that has to do with social media, right? I mean, it's just, um, uh, I mean, I don't know if there's people that are writing like dissertations or theses on what the, the effects on, of, of, of the internet uh, on, on our sanity, uh, but um, I'm, I'm sure it's quite profound, right? I mean, people waking up and, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to their mind is not a a dua or to pray, but, you know, checking their phone to see who's commenting on, who's praising me, who's, who's criticizing me, right? Um, and then, you know, just sort of getting into impulses, having a lack of discipline. I mean, I, uh, I was on Facebook, you know, until 2017. And um, at, at, at some point I said to myself, this is, there's some benefit to this, but... Um, I think the, the harm outweighs the benefit. Um, and it was difficult for me to sort of just be civilized with people. People want to debate me. People want to, and I just said, forget it. I'm not going to engage. And that's, that's just me though. I mean, there are people who can obviously, uh, I'm not saying, you know, get rid of social media. There's people that obviously we can use it for um, a, a good end and, and with, with a good intention. Uh, but the most important thing is, is the state of our heart. And if we feel like something is, is corrupting the state of our hearts and we should get rid of that thing, right? We should, mm. we should, we should have the ability, the adab, the discipline to be able to do that, right? Rather than sort of giving in. I mean, this is the age of feeling, right? I mean, you, you have the age of faith, you know, the age of reason. Now we have, and now it's the age of feeling. I feel this, I want to do this. I feel like I'm this. If it feels good, do it. Things like that. So, mm. um, yeah, it's, uh, like I said, you know, this is a, they're inward sciences that we've neglected. Mm. You, know, you, know, uh, you know how to deal with, with with arrogance, with ostentation, with vanity. You know we have we have uh, a whole tradition that deals with this. How to deal with these sciences? About mm. Ibrahim, he had a sound heart. Right, a sound heart is the most important mm. thing to bring to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala on the Yom Al Qiyamah. So I know a lot of the viewers are just waiting for the crucifixion stuff and a lot of the rational evidences, but I do have one last question. Unless, Rami, you have a question? No, go for it, bro. Okay, Bismillah. So it's it's common knowledge now, and I'm sure with your lived experience, you know, doing this for a long time, that there's a lot of debate disasters and coming at it to prove a point and defend an argument. It's not always the most conducive way to do Dawah to Christians. So this being said, what advice would you have for being aware of someone's emotional state and emotional obstacles of leaving Christianity? And how would you tackle that? Because I largely find that it's rarely an a logical issue or a rational issue, but it's usually some type of emotional attachment to Christianity and they just have this block coming to Islam. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a good question. Um, there needs to be a, you know, a support system. Um, you know, we, we, expend all of this energy to make converts and that's good but when they convert they seem to be sort of left to their own devices and many of them unfortunately they go back 
um, they revert back to their old religion uh, because they don't have that sort of support system to, to continue to guide them, right? Um, so j just to continue to, you know, to keep contact with new converts, to, to, you know, welcome them to the community, to give them resources, to answer their questions, uh, and to, uh, you know, to, um, to re reiterate these points I made earlier that, you know, if you leave Christianity, you know, you're not leaving the love of Jesus. You know, Muslims are required to, to love Jesus. Uh, he is a, a, a great prophet in our tradition. Um, and so don't think like you're forsaking Jesus or you're abandoning him um, or you're turning your back on him, right? Uh, he's a prophet in our tradition. Uh, so just to, you know, offer that type of continued support and education for Christians, because it is, you know, anyone who leaves any religion, there's going to be some trauma associated with that, mm -hmm. you know, especially with their family. If they have Christian parents, it's, it's very, very difficult to, um, uh, to to deal with, with parents that are constantly um, mm -hmm. wanting to sort of, you know, debate you or, uh, or and they, obviously they're doing it with good intentions because your your mother and father only want good for you. Uh, mm -hmm. And then how do they negotiate that pressure from their parents, but also having good adab with their parents, but still having that sort of istiqama in Islam? It's it's a difficult thing. But I think the short answer, Allah alam, the short answer is they need to have some sort of continued support system with the Muslims that guided them to Islam and not sort of just leave them out there just because they converted. Mm, yeah, there's a lot of comments on our on our streams when we talk about Christianity, and we have a revert that either takes the shahada or accepts Islam, and or they've already accepted Islam and now they share their journey. You see a lot of Christians commenting, "How could you turn your back on Jesus? How could you turn your How could you abandon Jesus? How could you leave Jesus?" And for me, it's it's very easy to spot that it's just out of ignorance. I don't think they're coming out of sideways. I just genuinely think they don't understand Islam and how we view Isa al Islam. Yeah, I mean, what what is what is a Christian? I mean, if you ask a Christian, what is a Christian? You might get an answer. You have to believe in the Bible. A Christian believes in the Bible. What well, the Bible wasn't canonized until the fourth century. I mean, it was Athanasius, his thirty ninth festal le letter. He was the first one to articulate this twenty seven book canon. That was in three sixty seven. That's fourth century. So there weren't Christians before the Bible. And say, okay, okay, to be a Christian. Uh, you have to believe um, that Jesus is God and he died for your sins. Now, according to historians, the earliest Christians did not believe that, right? This, this is essentially Pauline Christianity, mm. right? I mean, there were Christians, the, the Nazarenes, the, the Ebionites, who were probably, uh, you know, what the Nazarenes, what, what the early church fathers referred to the Nazarenes of the second century, the, the Ebionites, probably a derogatory term. A term. Uh, but they didn't believe that Jesus, are those are those not Christians? I mean, these are the earliest. So what is a Christian? You know, a Christian is basically, when it, when it comes down to it, uh, someone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah. Right? Wow. That's, what, that's what it means to be a Christian, according to this earliest conception, right? Um, when a Christian believes in the Trinity, that's, again, Trinity is fourth century. The, the Trinity wasn't made uh, official until 381 of the Common Era. Right? I mean, 324, 325, you have the Council of Nicaea, where hmm. you know, the Son of God officially became God the Son. And then 381, you deal with the Holy Spirit. Now you have the Trinity. The first true Trinitarian theologians are the, are the Cappadocian church fathers in, in, in Turkey. Uh, and Augustine of Hippo, these are 4th century, 5th century theologians. So that's what it comes up. The, the term Christian in its original sense means someone who believes that Jesus was the Messiah. And guess what? Muslims believe that Jesus is the Messiah, right? Uh, so, you know, we are Christian in that sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, in mm -hmm. that the Quran purports to be, and I think you can support this, uh, historically, the Quran purports to be or claims to be uh, a, um, a restoration of the original teachings of the historical Jesus of Nazareth. Right, and there, there are scholars who have mentioned this. You know, you can, you know, Hans Kung, in so many words, admitted this. You know, Robert Eisenman, uh, uh, James Tabor. You know, they, they, they've noticed these parallels between Islamic. I mean, they try to, you know, 
uh, try to explain these things naturalistically, right? So historically, right? That mm -hmm. there might have been Ebionites living in caves in Arabia. <laughs> the Prophet Sallallahu would go visit them. He learned their Christology and things like that. <laughs> so they have to have some sort of historical or naturalistic explanation as to how yeah. how Islam uh, managed to do that. Um, uh, but but yeah, I mean certainly. Uh, someone who becomes Muslim is actually following the religion of Jesus. Whereas Pauline Christianity, which is today Trinitarian Christianity, is not the religion of Jesus. It's the religion about Jesus. Hmm. We follow the religion of Isa alayhi salam. Right? Isa alayhi salam, you know, in the earliest gospel, as you know, you know, when he was asked by a Jewish lawyer, what is the greatest commandment? He quoted the Shema, that here are Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is Echad, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad, right? Hulo Allahu Ahad. This is the exact word. I mean, they're exact cognates. And one here means one, right? Mm. It doesn't mean three. One means one, you know? Pen means pen, and table means table, and man means man, and woman means woman. He, he said three, but he could have meant, he said one, but he could have meant three. No, he could have said that. No. He could have said that, right? Yeah. And I find it, I find it, subhanAllah, that the word ahad only occurs once in the Quran. Exactly. Yeah. One and only. I mean, this, this is the plain meaning of the text, right? Jesus did not tr teach Trinitarian Christianity, right? Yeah. Even according to the New Testament. Uh, Paul did not even teach Trinitarian Christianity. The authors of the New Testament were not Trinitarians. They were not Unitarians either. I don't think Paul is a Unitarian. I think he adopted this kind of um, henotheistic um, uh, world view that is prevalent in the, in the Greco-Roman world. And he was a highly Hellenized Jew, um, but I don't believe him when he says that he was a Pharisee, if he even said that. You know, it's, it's I mean, um, we, we have to, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, Trinitarian Christianity did not become, and Christianity did not become officially Trinitarian until way later, the fourth century. So this is the religion of Jesus, peace be upon him. Wow, wow. That's very briefly said. So a lot of Christians are going to find that hard to believe. So I, I kind of want to walk through what maybe the majority of New Testament scholars claim or believe about Jesus. So it seems to be the case that Jesus first came as, you know, what they call an apocalypticist, that he believed that there's life after death and the end times were coming. And he was a follower of the Mosaic law. And he actually came to make practicing the Mosaic law easier for the people. So he came to the people, told them to worship one God, gave them, basically reminded them of the Mosaic law and maybe made some things easier for them to practice in terms of that law and legislation. And then sometime after Jesus, you know, died or disappeared or left or was risen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, came a man predominantly, I believe Paul was the one who kind of orchestrated a, a, this kind of huge movement where he was claiming Jesus is God, claimed to be God, died for our sins, and so on and so forth. And then this Christology kind of became common. I don't know at what point, but at some point that Jesus was God and that he died for your sins. And then throughout the next few hundred years, you have a lot of speculation on how that worked. You know, is it this hypostatic union that he's, he has a God nature and a man nature and they don't contend with each other? Is it modalism that Jesus had different modes? Is it separationism that, um, you know, it, he, he, you know, the, the, it was separate somehow? Um, or was it eventually what came to be Trinitarianism that they're all co-equal, co-eternal? Apologize, my camera just dropped off. But Dr. Ali, if you want to jump in on that, inshallah, I think that'd be great. Yeah, so... <clears throat> I think I think the, uh, the the problem is that the um, the first New Testament author is Paul of Tarsus, right? Um, and Paul was not a disciple of, of Jesus. Uh, nobody believes that that Paul uh, met the historical Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, peace be upon him. So he's the initial author of the New Testament, uh, and clearly from his letters. And people don't know this because they read the Bible and they you know. They read it in its canonical order. And, you know, after the Old Testament, you come to the book of Matthew. Uh, then you have Mark, then you have Luke, then you have John, then you have the book of Acts, and then eventually you get to the letters of Paul. And you think, well, this, these are the orders of the books uh, chronologically, but that's not true. Um, everyone agrees that Paul's letters were the first Christian writings that eventually made it into the New Testament. 
right? Um, which is a bit strange because we know from historical sources, uh, uh, the book of Acts, um, for what it's worth historically, uh, as well as uh, Josephus and others, that the early Christian movement uh, after Jesus, peace be upon him, the leader of the Christians was James. And it's amazing, most Christians haven't even heard of James. Like, who's James? I mean, James, you know, the one of the disciples of Jesus that's mentioned. Uh, no, James, the brother of Jesus, right? Uh, Yaqub had Sadiq, this is what he's called, James the just, James the righteous. He was the leader of the, uh, of the early Christians, of the, of the Nazarenes in Jerusalem for 30 years, right? Uh, where are his authentic writings? Uh, he didn't write anything. The, oh, the only Christian that, that, that was writing, uh, you know, these letters and epistles was Paul of Tarsus, you know, and there's, there's 14 attributed to him. Only seven of them, according to almost a consensus of historians, only seven of them are genu genuinely Pauline, written by Paul. They're authentic from Paul in the New Testament. The other seven or six are forgeries. Um, uh, but, but where are the letters of James? You know, so it's like hearing one side of a phone conversation, right? If you're listening to someone talking on the phone, you can only hear what this person is saying, but you don't know what the other person is saying. So what is what is James actually saying? From Paul's letters, we know that he has conflict with, with other Christians, right? Uh, I mean, read Galatians, read 1 Corinthians. It's very, very clear that he has enemies uh, that are Christians. Um, and at one point in Galatians, you know, he... He basically chastises, you know, Peter, James, and John, right? So um, he has major conflict with disciples of Jesus, you know. And this calls into question his his vision on the road to Damascus, you know, his his sort of um, experience apocalypse he had, you know, who did he actually see on the road to Damascus? If if um, this vision is because of this conflict that he's having with actual disciples of Jesus, then uh, we are not out of line to question um, Paul's sincerity or his uh, belief that what he saw was the actual sort of resurrection, the resurrected uh, Christ, uh, because he is in major conflict uh, with actual disciples uh, of Jesus. Um, so th that's a big problem. And also the four Gospels, as we said, they're written after the Pauline corpus. So all four Gospels are highly influenced by Pauline Christianity or Pauline Christology. And, and Paul clearly believes, and I don't think, to me, it's, it's just very clear. And, and people want to sort of, you know, they want to uh, obfuscate. But it's very clear that Paul believed that the second coming of Jesus was going to be in his own lifetime. I mean, just, just read 1 Thessalonians. It's very, very clear. All of his advice is predicated upon, you know, the second coming of Jesus. That's going to be imminent, right? Don't, don't even get bothered to get married, right? Uh, don't even count on using your goods that you've bought um, because uh, we're going to be transformed in the twinkling of an eye and caught up in the clouds uh, with the Lord. I mean, he really believes that, that it's going to happen any day now. Uh, and that's, it just, it didn't happen. You know, that's, um, Paul was wrong about that. Wow. But unfortunately, we have the four Gospels, and in the earliest of the canonical Gospels, the Gospel of Mark, uh, this idea of an, an imminent second coming of Jesus is actually put into the mouth of Jesus by the author of Mark. We can, can, call, we can conveniently call him Mark. We don't know who wrote the Gospel of Mark, but certainly a Pauline Christian uh, who did believe you know, Mark is writing around 67 or 70 or something like that. So right, you know, at the end of the generation of the apostles, a right, generation of its 40 years, you know, Isa alayhi salam, you know, ascended around the, uh, around the uh, year 30. So you go ahead 40 years, it's right around 70. And the Mark in Jesus says, there are some standing here that shall not taste death until, until they see the Son of Man coming in great power. The, the present generation will live to see it all, Right. And so the mark in Jesus made a false prophecy. That's not the real Isai de Islam, right? That is uh, the mark in Jesus who was highly influenced by Pauline Christology. But here's the thing. I, I want to see, I, I, want, I, want, I want to discover, a, a, you know, a, a, uh, an epistle written by James, you know, and, and the epistle of James in the New Testament, everyone agrees that's a fabrication. James didn't write that. That's like a second century First and second, Peter. Peter didn't write these things. 
know, Peter was an illiterate fisherman from the Galilee. I mean, he, he wrote these, uh, he wrote first and second Peter, that John, the son of Zebedee, write the gospel of John. And historically, this doesn't make any sense. If Christians want to say, yeah, you know, John, the son of Zebedee, you know, he, he waited until he was about 90 years old. and You know, he studied, he studied a bunch of, uh, you know, Greek philosophy and he became a master of the Greek language. And then he wrote his gospel finally. And he said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. You know, he wrote that. Okay, if, if they want to believe that, that's fine. But historically, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, none of the books of the New Testament were written by disciples of Jesus. And this is, this is not something, this is not a polemical claim I'm making. This is standard, you know, New Testament scholarship. Many confessional Christians will admit to this, right? I'm not, you know, insulting or attacking the Bible here. This, this is just something that's historically true. Uh, among the vast majority of, of critical scholars of the New Testament. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, I would say that, I would say that Paul basically, um, he, he married, the, you know, Judaism with this idea of a dying and rising savior, man, God. I don't believe that Paul believed that Jesus was the God, right? But, but that Jesus was a God, a divine son of God, mm -hmm. right? Um, but not, uh, not, uh, identical to God, but equal in authority to God. Wow. And that's, that's interesting. And I think that on the note of, you know, kind of unanimous or majority opinion for the scholars in New Testament scholarship, I feel that there's a huge disconnect between the, the New Testament scholars and the scholarship and like the everyday average Christian, because every Christian that I speak to, I say these very basic claims that none of the gospels uh, let alone any of the other books, just the Gospels were authored by, uh, you know, eyewitnesses or disciples. And they just cannot fathom it. They just they yeah. think that I'm just denying blatant history. And I'm like, I'm quoting names. I'm saying, you know, C.S. Lewis, Bart Ehrman, all these scholars are saying historically, they're agreeing that one will never have the original. And two, they were not written by eyewitnesses or disciples and they can't fathom it. So what do you think is an, effic uh, an efficient or effective way to get this point across to the average layman? Yeah, I mean, people just have to be honest with themselves and, and engage in, you know, this is standard, standard his historical studies of the New Testament. This is not some revisionist, you know, like, you know, people today, they say like, like the Quran is in Aramaic, it's not Arabic. And uh, what is it? The, the original Qibla is <laughs> in Jordan. And, and th this is just laughably incorrect. And, this is, this is totally revisionist. Uh, but what we're saying about the New Testament is, is completely mainstream historically. I learned these things in a Christian seminary. I took a class at a school called the Jesuit School of Theology. That's the name of the school. And our professor was not some you know, liberal California weirdo. He was a priest. He was a Catholic priest, okay? Uh, and in that class, he taught us the documentary hypothesis of Julius Wellhausen. He taught us uh, the two uh, source theory uh, of the New Testament, uh, you know, that Matthew and, and Luke, they took from Mark, but they also had another source, source called Q. Uh, and I said, well, there's a Q source. And the Q source is it's probably pre-Pauline, um, you know, and so it's not, it, it's not sort of um, influenced by, by Pauline Christology. And, and, you know, I heard a podcast recently with John Dominic Crossan, uh, and he said that his, you know, scholars have tried to reconstruct the Q source document. And he said, and Dennis McDonald as well, they, they make this point that there's nothing about the crucifixion or so-called resurrection of Jesus in the Q source document. And the Q source document is the earliest source that the, that the gospel authors had, had access to. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it comes down to just, um, you know, like you said, there's a strong emotional attachment. I know like at some Christian seminaries, they actually have exit counseling because they, they have to sort of check, you know, the faith of, of Christian seminarians leaving the seminary. Are you like, are you still Christian after going through the ringer? I mean, they really, they really, de you know, um, deconstruct uh, the, the Bible in, in, a, in a very critical way. But it's still, you know, it, you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, 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 it's a historical criticism of the text. You know, um, uh, so, um, yeah, I think it's just a, a lack of education. People need to, you know, they need to step up their, uh, but yeah, like you said, it's, it's hard to do that. 
Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent, absolutely. So we have a few comments here. I do want to get to them because uh, it's almost been an hour already, and I'm, uh, it's very clear that we're going to need more than one part. So inshallah, we'll definitely bring you back very soon. But to start with the super chat, Al Sabr says, uh, "Very happy to see Doctor Atay on the Three Muslims podcast. Learn so much about Judaism, Christianity. Thanks to him. May Allah bless you all. Um, Jazakallah khairan from, oh, from Marseille, France. I think it's Marseille." Marseille, sorry, uh, we need Onhill, bro. He's he's stuck. <laughs> like I'm Canadian too. I'm supposed to know French. <laughs> I know, bro. It's okay. I'm good, yeah. like that. So that's Jazak uh, Khair, Salam, May Allah bless you. We got a new revert, uh, I think, from Christianity to Islam, Tortoise King. May Allah bless you. We're gonna have him uh, this Wednesday on the podcast to make a uh, special appearance. He said, uh, "Have some watch Doctor uh, Ali's videos. He's really good." May Allah bless you. Barakallahu fikum. And I think this is something you're just before, but maybe if you have a few remarks, talking about Paul, he was killed for his belief. He wasn't lying. So if someone's willing to die for their belief, then how could they be a liar? Yeah, I mean, do Christians believe that Muslims who, you know, Muslims who die for their belief, um, they, they have to be right because they died for their belief or like a, a Hindu who gives his life. So it's just a non sequitur argument. Uh, we don't know what happened to Paul. The death of Paul is not mentioned in the New Testament. This is just based on church history and tradition. We don't know what happened to the disciples. Wow. And this is not this is not like me speaking as a Muslim. You can ask a secular historian what happened to the disciples, and they say we don't know. There are legends from the third and fourth century that that they were martyred and decapitated and crucified upside down and things like that. But uh, we don't know what happened to Paul. I mean, in the book of Acts, chapter twenty-one or twenty-two, something like that, Paul is you know he sort of. He's preaching in the temple precincts and the Jews start beating him. Uh, and then um, he basically appeals to Caesar because he has Roman citizenship. I don't know how he has that. But somehow <laughs> he has Roman citizenship. And then he's actually the Roman legionnaires. They come and they, they protect him and he gives a speech and then they escort him back to Rome. And that's the last we hear of Paul in the book of Acts. What actually happened to him, we don't know. Church history teaches that he was, you know, decapitated and he's buried somewhere in Rome. But, you know, that's that's those are later legends. Maybe that's what happened. I don't know. But historically, it doesn't have a lot of weight. We're yeah. talking historically. Uh, yeah. So, but to answer the question, just because someone gives their life for something, it doesn't mean that uh, that what, what they believe was true. I mean, certainly we know that, right? Yeah. Yeah, even if they were they were martyred or they died in kind of a, the fashion of a martyr, um, because we have many Muslims, as you mentioned, that did that as well. So and it seems to be the case that it's not just, you know, this one point that is very speculative. It seems like at almost every fundamental point for Christianity, it's it's very speculative. You know, uh, there is actually even enough speculation on the crucifixion of Jesus, definitely the resurrection. You know, people love to quote, oh, it's 500 people who witnessed it. But it's, it's one source that says 500 people. So there's a lot, I think, of just ignorance with Christians in regards to their own faith and in how certain these things are historically. And I think and I, I want your opinion on this before I go to some other comments. Do you think it's because we don't have anything more solid than the Bible? Like the Bible is maybe the best historical source we have for early Christians in Christianity. Or is it something else? Is it the faith? Yeah, I mean, the only... I mean, the, the only sources we have of, uh, that mention Jesus from the first century that are authentically written in the first century are, are the Gospels, right? And I think most scholars would put the Gospels in the first century. There are a few that would put, you know, the, the Gospel of Luke in the second century, the Book of Acts, obviously, is part two of Luke in the second century, the Gospel of John. Many would put that in the early second century, even, even sort of 110, 120, something like that. But I think most would say that Mark and, and Matthew are written in the first century. Um, there, there are references, there's a reference, a couple of references in Josephus, uh, a reference of, uh, to uh, Jesus of Nazareth. One of them is probably a total uh, forgery. Uh, we don't find it uh, in any, uh, um, uh, it's not mentioned by any Christian scholar until the fourth century, um, Eusebius of Caesarea. So he, he's probably the one that fabricated it um, about, about uh, Jesus being sort of killed and uh, more than a man and things like that, very sort of Christian uh, undertones. Um, so for all intents and purposes, there's really nothing in Greek, in, in, in Roman or Jewish sources that mention Jesus. So yeah, we, we're sort of, sort of stuck with the New Testament sources. 
Um, but with the New Testament, as I mentioned, you know, if we engage in a type of um, historical analysis of these Gospels, uh, we can do a bit of um, uh, a bit of uh, separ separating the wheat and the chaff, as it were. Uh, and uh, scholars have, have dealt with these texts, and, and so I, I would encourage people to to take a good class on historical criticism. When I, when I say criticism again, I, I don't mean to necessarily find fault with something. That's how we sort of use the word criticism in our modern sort of, you know, it's like the word apology. You know, apology for hundreds of years meant to defend something, but nowadays it means to say I'm sorry, right? So criticism means to really engage with something in an academic sense, mm -hmm. right? So I encourage people to do that. You should take a class and, you know, and I encourage the Muslims to do it with the Quran. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think the difference is the more we engage critically with the Quran historically, the more our faith is actually strengthened. Um, and this is, this is seen with our, you know, we notice this with our narrative, right? The Quran is, is, you know, it's, um, it was standardized in the seventh century by the, by the uh, codex committee of Sayyidina Uthman. This was our standard narrative for 14 centuries. And of course, you had revisionists all throughout that time challenging this. No, it's an 8th century document. And there was a committee of people who wrote it and so on and so forth. And, but now this is becoming much more mainstream among secular historians. Uh, but I, I don't think you can say that about um, the, the New Testament um, Gospels, mm -hmm. um, that when you actually study these things and 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 uh, at, a, at a deeper level, at a historical level, you'll notice that there are problems, right? That there are inconsistencies, that there are contradictions. Um, you know, if, if Matthew believed that the gospel of Mark was divinely inspired, why would he, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in effect, uh, why would he redact portions of Mark's gospel? There are things that Mark says that Matthew doesn't like. He didn't include them. Uh, why would he do that if he believed that Mark was inspired by, by the Holy Spirit to write his gospel? You know, the Mark in Jesus, you know, his final words on the cross are this cry of dereliction, you know, ilahi, ilahi, lama sabachthan, right? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew, uh, Matthew included that, but Luke didn't like that. And Luke has Mark on his desk, as it were, right? But he didn't like, he didn't, he didn't like the fact that the last words of Jesus was him accusing God of forsaking him, of abandoning him, right? Uh, so um, this is a major problem, right? If you want to say, no, 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 Luke, you know, it was, Mark did not, Luke did not have Mark. Well, then you're, you're putting yourself in conflict with the vast majority of critical scholars in the New Testament. Right? Oh, great answer. Jazakallah khair. Um, Fahad, do you have any questions before I jump to a few more comments? No, man, go for it. All right, so Orlando, actually, let's start with the Super Chat. Um, can you ask Dr. Ali about the book of Revelations, who wrote it, and where did the author get his inspiration from to write it? Uh, Love and Peace, brothers. The book of Re Revelation, it's not, it's a singular, it's not plural. <laughs> the book of Revelation. Um, it's called the Apocalypse in the Catholic uh, version. So who wrote it? We don't know who wrote it. Um, just like we don't know who actually wrote the four gospels. It's an anonymous book. Um, it's attributed uh, in tradition uh, to, uh, to John of Patmos. Now there are many Johns in the New Testament. Is this a, a, a John that is in addition to the author of the gospel of John? Many, many Christians will say it's the same John. Uh, some would say, no, it's a different John. So nobody knows who wrote it. Okay. Um, so, it is the author of the, of, of the book of Revelation writing about the end times, something that happened in the future, or is he writing about something that's happening during his lifetime? That's also a, a question for historians uh, to ponder. Uh, you know, like what he says about, I think it's Revelation 13, 18, you know, the, the fairy on the beast whose number is 666, right? Uh, is he talking about the Antichrist to come in the future, or is he talking about uh, the Emperor Nero, uh, apparently the Emperor Nero's name in Latin or in Greek, whatever it is, the numerical value of his name is 666. Wow. Or he's talking about both, this idea that he's sort of uh, referring to a historical figure at his time, but also there's, there's sort of a, a foreshadowing of a figure to come uh, in the future. Uh, so the short answer is 
you know, historians don't know who wrote the book of Revelation. I don't think the author identifies himself. If he does, I'd have to look back again at it. Um, is it the same John who wrote the Gospel of John? That's that's a that's a that's an open question. Yeah, and even even if he did identify himself, we would still have to bring in the question if he's being truthful or if it's another fabrication. Correct? Yeah, yeah. Because like I said, um, you know, there's there are thirteen letters of Paul that are explicitly attributed. Whoever wrote these letters identifies himself as Paul, but the vast majority of historians would say only seven of them are, are genuinely written by Paul. The other six are actually forgeries in Paul's name. Wow. So, you know, a, a Christian apologist may say, well, you know, doing something like that in the ancient world wasn't necessarily, um, you know, like, you know, immoral or deceptive or something. Yeah. But, but I would disagree with that. And Bart Ehrman wrote a book. Um, on on this topic called forged, and, and he says that by and large, uh, forgeries in the ancient world uh, were done with with ill intention and with the intention of deceiving their audiences, right? Uh, so, I think it was a way to sort of save Paul from from uh, massive criticism that he was probably getting. Like you know, like, again, in first first uh, Th Thessalonians, it's very clear that Paul believes the second coming is going to be during his his lifetime. But in second uh, uh, Thessalonians, um, you know, uh, now you have Paul saying, well, there's a few things that have to happen uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, so it seems like whoever wrote second Thessalonians was a was a Pauline, you know, devotee uh, who tried to save his master from massive criticism that he was probably getting from other Christians who are accusing Paul of making a false prophecy. Wow. Well, it's kind of law. And um, I, I, like I mentioned before, I did an interview with Dr. Dennis McDonald, which inshallah will be edited and posted hopefully soon. We're just looking for a, uh, a, a podcast editor for the time being. If any of you know anyone, let me know, inshallah. And um, he wrote a book, um, and this isn't exactly the same, right, as forgeries, but something you discussed. And this is how I was introduced to it, literary mimesis, which is the idea that you would take a story that already exists with, with you know, a, a very you know, a uh, heroic figure or a great figure from the past, you would take that story and manage to apply it to Jesus and make Jesus not only the hero and main character in that plot that you stole, but make him better than the original person yeah. somehow. And they did this uh, in, as Dennis McDonald described, not a, not a, a, a malicious way. It wasn't in a malicious manner. It was just to get to a deeper truth and really... Yeah exaggerate this truth about jesus that he was so amazing that he's like this person that i'm taking this story from but even better and this is done all over the uh the new testament and the gospels and i think one case if this is i this may be or may not be the same story you were just quoting but one of the disciples or students of paul i think his name was luke wrote that paul saw this vision of jesus when he was on the road and there's a lot of specific language used, a lot of specific plot points used. And it's just exactly the same as I think something that was included in like a Greek play or something like that hundreds of years or years before the, the student of Paul wrote it. So I find it amazing that these just blatant, um, you know, stealing of stories and, and, and maybe forgeries or fabrications, um, you know, are out there and people are not talking about it. Yeah, no, you're talking about something found in Euripides' Bacchae, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, Pentheus, right? Uh, yeah. His, his, uh, his, um, <laughs> his encounter with Dionysus, very similar to Paul's encounter with the so-called resurrected Jesus. No, this was this was standard amongst the Greek novelists. So, so Mark, for example, he's a, you know he's a he's an elite Greek novelist, uh, and this was the style of writing at the time uh, that they would borrow stories. Um, uh, they would um, uh, they would use what's known as a flexible genre, uh, where they would exaggerate certain things, and and it's it's known what he was doing, and I think he knew that his audience knew what he was doing because this was an acceptable uh, practice. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. the author of John's Gospel, he moves the cru crucifixion date up one day, right? And and the author of John's Gospel, we can call him John. It's not like he didn't know that his readers wouldn't figure this out. Of course they would figure this out, but that's not his concern. His concern is not necessarily to do accurate history. His concern is to communicate his Christology. So he wanted to move the, Christ the crucifixion date up because that's, that's fine to do. 
uh, according to his genre of writing, to make a theological point that Jesus was crucified on the day when the lambs were being slaughtered, right? So here's the Lamb of God. I mean, Jesus is called the Lamb, Lamb of God only in John's Gospel, and the Baptist sees him. In the beginning of God's, John's Gospel, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes, the sin of, who takes away the sin of the world, which is very different than the Baptist in the synoptic tradition, who was saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, John doesn't really care about that inconsistency because he wants his Christology um, to um, basically convince people, as he says at the end of his Gospel, these things have been written for you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God. Um, right, so this is this kind of flexible genre, and a lot of a lot of Christian scholars today are admitting this, even so evangelical scholars. Uh, you know, so like for example, the um, in the Gospel of Matthew, we're told that when Jesus was resurrected, these Jewish saints were also resurrected. They came out of their graves. Right, some have called this sort of a zombie apocalypse and, and whatever, uh, and they walked around the streets of Jerusalem. Right, um, you know, there are Christian scholars. Many Christian scholars today will say, well, that's you know. That's an example of, you know, sort of special effects. Uh, this didn't really happen. It's not historical that the author of Matthew mm -hmm. uh, is trying to make a theological point, right, according to his genre of writing. And that's true. That's how the ancient Greek novelists wrote their, their, their books and novels. Uh, but the problem is modern readers of these things, uh, they're not familiar with this genre, so they believe these things to be completely historical. Uh, and that's just not, you know, it's not accurate according to, you know, we try to read our own sort of way of doing things today back into the ancient world and it just doesn't work. Yeah. And it's actually, it seems to very, be very interesting because, um, it, for example, when Jesus uh, allegedly says in one of the gospels that just like, I think Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three, three nights, um, three days, three nights, the son of man will also be in the belly of the earth and then so on and so forth. And it's like, Christians will read this and be like, see, he made a prophecy. And what seems to be the case is that, no, someone stole the story from the Old Testament about Jonah and then put it onto Jesus in a form of literary mimesis to exaggerate this point that he is not only familiar with the work and the prophets, but that he is divine in a way or that he will be killed and resurrected and all this stuff. So it's 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 amazing, you know, what faith does to a person, because there is a very rational explanation that is you know, congruent with all the different examples that we discuss and that are out there that scholars have uh, written about and examined in depth, but they'd rather at this point believe that it's all truthful and that Jesus is God and all of this stuff. So I think it's, it's, it's very interesting, but I would love to dig deeper inshallah and in that I think probably on future episodes. Um, I do have a few more comments if, uh, if we have time for that. Yeah, go ahead. Go. All right. Bismillah. So Jonathan, uh, thank you for the super chat he says could the Christ claimant uh, that Paul saw in his vision be the Christ claimant that Jesus peace be upon him warned against that would misguide his ummah um, Allahu Adam um, I, don't, I don't know um, did Paul actually have this vision or not uh, who knows you know something did happen to Paul I mean I have a, a my opinion of Paul is, is you know I, I, I expressed it so I did a podcast with, with Paul Williams on on blogging theology, I encourage people to watch that on the crucifixion, where, where I get into sort of my my stance on on Paul. But I'm just raising a question. I mean, if if Paul claims to have seen uh, Isa alayhi uh, salam in a vision, but this vision is putting him into conflict with disciples, and that conflict is very very clear. We can see it in Paul's own letters, the genuine corpus, the Book of Galatians, the First Corinthians. Paul's enemies are. You know, men, men of men from James, men sent from James. You know, well, who's James? James is the successor of Isa, they said. Uh, he's the leader of the Nazarenes for 30 years. Why is Paul in conflict with these people? What does that say about the nature of his vision with the so-called resurrected Jesus? Right. Uh, so that's all I'm doing. I'm calling these things into question. Like, is this was that really Jesus? Is Paul really telling the truth here? Maybe it was some, someone else that, that Paul saw. Um, so, Allahu um, Alam. Like I said, unfortunately, we don't have anything authentic uh, from Peter or James, right? Uh, the Epistle of James and First and Second Peter; these are not written by James and Peter, by almost consensus of New Testament historians. Um, so, yeah. All right, Jazakallah Khair. Next question. 
I believe there is a biblical prophecy by Jacob that warned about someone that fits the description of Paul of Tarsus, something like a Benjamin is a mm -hmm. ravenous wolf or something like that. Yeah, there's uh, Genesis 49. Yeah, I explained that one time um, also on a podcast. <laughs> one of the early church fathers, actually, I forget who it is. I have to look back at it, but he actually identifies uh, <laughs> Paul as being uh, this ravenous wolf, but then he said, "Well, he, you know, he converted and he became, he became, uh, you know, a, a devoted follower." Uh, so they, so even some Christian, early Christian fathers, they see that parallel uh, between between Paul and and really Saul, right? So like Saul, because Paul's name is Saul, right? Paul's actual name is Shaul, which means the one who is responsible. Interestingly enough, the Masul, right? So, so Saul is sort of a uh, the type, and then Paul of Tarsus is the anti-type. So just as Saul, um, this is how they they explain it. Just as King Saul persecuted David, right? Uh, Paul of Tarsus will persecute Jesus, who is supposed to be the Davidic uh, Messiah. Uh, so even Christian authors they saw that that parallel um, as well. So yeah, some of the, some of the some of the early Christian fathers they identified Paul as being the ravenous wolf. That was um, that was prophesied by Jacob on his deathbed, but he became good at the end because he accepted the gospel. I see. Well, it's very interesting. It's been a lot. And uh, last one I have saved here is: Can you ask Doctor Ali Atai if he read Benjamin Summers' work on the bodies of God and if Genesis eighteen was heavily redacted? Benjamin Summer, no, I haven't read that. Okay, and any comment on Genesis eighteen uh, if it was heavily redacted? Well, I mean, the uh, the the Torah as we have it. Right. Um, there, I don't know of a single critical historian or critical scholar who believes that that what we have today, as, as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that this was written by Moses on Sinai, uh, fourteen, you know, fourteen hundred years BCE. Um, I don't know of anyone who believes that. Even amongst most uh, Jews, I mean, it's only really the Orthodox who cling to this position. Uh, the dominant opinion is that um, the Torah, as we have it, the Pentateuch, as we have it, these five books uh, were really sort of stitched together by a redactor around 500 BCE. So there were really four independent accounts um, uh, of, of, um, of four, four, basically four independent accounts of ancient Israelite history. And scholars refer to this as the J source, the E source, the D source, and the P source. This is called the documentary hypothesis. It's still pretty much the standard, I would say, in most you know Christian seminaries. This is not this is not something that Muslims came up with to slander the Bible. This is something you learn in Christian seminary. Okay, the documentary hypothesis of Julius Wellhausen, um, and so uh, the Book of Genesis is really. Uh, um, a, an amalgamation of these four uh, sources. And one of the sources, the J source written around 1000 BCE uh, is very anthropomorphic, right? The way that it describes God uh, in very human terms. Uh, whereas, uh, and so some, some chapters of, of Genesis uh, reflect that type of uh, theology. But there are other chapters of Genesis that reflect the E, the E source, the E author, who was more transcendent in his descriptions uh, of God. Uh, so God is more transcendent. Um, uh, so, but I haven't heard of this 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 man's uh, work. All right, Jazakallah khair. And I think the last one for the day is a super chat from Mark. Jazakallah khair, Mike. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I said Mike. Mark, <laughs> shout out to Dr. Ali and favorite, uh, my favorite scholar, aka Beast Mode. Thank you for all the knowledge you have put up in here uh, and your videos on the significance of Ahlul Bayt. Salam. I love you all, Mark. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, God bless. And I think, inshallah, will be good to wrap it up. I do have one final question for myself. Um, I feel like it, it might be a bit of a silly question because every person is is different and what works for one person might not work for another. But what do you say there is a best argument, for lack of a better term, or a best way to explain to Christians in light of the Quran why their theology is incorrect and why Islam is correct? Yeah, I would I would appeal to theological consistency, right? So So the major reason why uh, the Jews rejected Jesus is not because they rejected the historical Jesus. It's because they rejected the New Testament Jesus, right? 
So the Talmud, if you read the Talmud, you know, what, what the Talmud says about Jesus is, is in reaction to the New Testament Jesus. That's not the real Jesus, right? Because a Jew could never accept the New Testament Jesus because it's a breach of Tohid, right? Mm. Uh, the New Testament Jesus or the Christian Jesus, the sort of Jesus of Christian faith, taught his own deity. This is impossible to believe uh, as a Jew. It's, it's shirk, it's idolatry, right? Uh, a Jew cannot possibly believe that. Um, so, I mean, how does, how does one reconcile, you know, the New Testament Jesus, or I should say the, the, the Jesus of Christian faith with clear passages in the Old Testament, right? Lo ish el God is not a man that he should lie. And, the, and that's sort of a, a strange translation, but the mean, that's Numbers 23, 19. But the, the real meaning of that is any man who claims to be God is a liar. Wow. Right? A man who claims to be God is lying. Right? So the Jews have that very clear text, right? This is like Muhkam, it's Wadi, it's, you know, it's very, very clear, you know, uh, Hosea 11, 9, um, uh, that uh, indeed I am God and not a man, right? So you have they have these verses. So then why would God suddenly become a man and expect people to believe him and not just any people, Jews, to believe him? Mm. Um, uh, you know, in John chapter eight, the Johannine Jesus. Again, this is not the historical Jesus. This is the, this is the Jesus of the Gospel of John, and this only happens in John. The Johannine Jesus, uh, he tells the Jews that are arguing with him that you are children of Satan, right? You're children of Satan because they don't believe uh, Jesus' claims that, you know, he's God, according to the standard sort of Trinitarian reading of these passages. How could they believe he's God? They, they would commit blasphemy by doing that. And Christians admit that, that Jesus was crucified for blasphemy. He committed blasphemy. So why would the New Testament Jesus ever... Uh, expect anyone to believe in him if he's going around uh, committing blasphemy, right? It doesn't make any sense. You, you can't blame the Jews for disbelieving in him. Why would they believe someone who's, who's going around uh, making blasphemous uh, claims? Uh, so it's, it's totally incoherent. So what Islam does, right, what Islamic Christology does is that it restores, right, this, this tawhid to the world. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the greatest monotheist in the history of humanity, right? And so this is just a fact. And, and monotheism is the, the claim to fame of the Jews. They believe that they were, you know, that, that they were chosen by God to spread the light of El Echad, of the one God, of monotheism uh, to the world. So, you know, Jewish writers in the, in the medieval period, they were very, very... Um, um, uh, hesitant uh, to, uh, to, to ascribe any type of kid or any type of um, uh, de deceitfulness on, on the Prophet وسلم, because they recognize that he brought monotheism like no one else. Right? Mm -hmm. So you'll find opinions of him like, for example, Rabbi Nathaniel Al-Fayumi -Al in his book uh, is called uh, Bustan al -Rukul. Or something, Gan Hasachlichim, or something like that in Hebrew, uh, the Garden of the Intellects. He says that he believes that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a Nevi Emet, which means a true prophet, but he was only sent to the Goyim. He's only sent to the uh, to the Gentiles, so like the ninety nine point nine percent of uh, of humanity, right? And there were many Jews even in Medina that believed he was a true prophet. We read it in Sahih Bukhari that Jews would come and sit in the Prophet's presence and sneeze on purpose. Because they wanted a prophet to say "Yarhamukumullah" to him, to them, to them. And the hadith says that the prophet would say "Allahu," he, the prophet says "Allahu yahdikum, wa yusrihu balakum." May Allah guide you and and uh, mm. states. Um, so the Jews were very loath, very hesitant to ascribe any type of kid to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But the New Testament Jesus, you know, it's it's obvious for them this can't be a prophet. Because a prophet would never, ever claim to be God. A prophet would never claim to die for anyone's sins. This is in, in total breach of Mosaic tradition, of, of the Torah, 
of, of you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years of Jewish tradition. Why would a rabbi at, at a Passover Seder, you know, pass a cup of wine around and say, drink this, this is my blood? Would, would a rabbi do that? I mean, this is, this is something that uh, is, uh, is repugnant, um, revolting, drinking someone's blood, right? Uh, clearly, this is not historical. This does not come from the historical Jesus of Nazareth. So I, I think that's a very strong argument to make, mm -hmm. that Islam is really, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, is really a restoration of the true teachings, the Christology of Jesus, that brings back this uh, this, this, this rigid monotheism, this tohid, mm -hmm. right? That you can continue to love Jesus and honor him and follow him, uh, but do not worship him because Jesus himself did not, did not worship uh, himself as it were, uh, did not claim to be God, but he worshiped the one and only true God who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, Allah, people get hung up on these terms. Uh, you know, Allah is the God of Abraham, right? It's not, it's not, it's not, we can, we, maybe we can do another podcast on this topic. Mm -hmm. Muslims say they believe in Allah. I mean, Jesus spoke Syriac. He didn't speak Aramaic. I mean, sorry, he didn't speak English. Um, he didn't speak, probably didn't speak Greek. Maybe he did a little bit, but in, in his own language, Syriac or Aramaic, uh, the word for God is Allah, right? That's how we would have said God. Um, so uh, in, in all Semitic languages, you know, the Alif Lam is found for the, for the word God in almost every Semitic language, but that's a different topic. Uh, but I would, think, I, would, I would point out that um, theological consistency is a very strong argument. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And I, I think it's, it's amazing because it uses kind of Judaism and their, their theology as a common de denominator in a way. It's like we're not just claiming these things about Jesus. We're, we're using the common denom denominator, which is the Old Testament, which is what Jews already believed to show that, listen, if you if you want to claim that Jesus was just this Jewish preacher and he came to the, the Jews and then, you know, died for the sins of humanity, OK, no problem. But you still have to deal with all of these what you pointed out inconsistencies. And I think that's amazing because I think the way you articulated it was, was beautiful. And I think that it's more than enough for most people. But if someone wanted to take it further, I saw a few comments, things like, you know, hanging on a cross someone who hung on a cross in the Old Testament is a cursed person sacrificing your own children. This is not something that's fathomable from the Old Testament, um, you know, on top of the things you mentioned. So now this begs the question. I think this is really good for the next stream that we do. If these things didn't come from Jesus, where do they come from? Mm -hmm. And I, I, if people want to get ahead on that question, watch um, the presentations that Dr. Atai did on blogging theology with Paul Williams, because he discusses this in depth with different philosophies that were injected into um, the Christology of Jesus and, and what people believed about him. So with that being said, Jazakallah khair so much. Uh, everyone who came and attended, who uh, contributed, Jazakallah khair for the Super Chat. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Atai, for joining us today. It has been a tremendous honor. And I want to give you and Fayad the last words, inshallah, before we end the stream. I can't wait for part two, man, inshallah, with Anhal this time. Because Brother Anhal used to be, you know, he was a Catholic, he was a Christian, and then he reverted to Islam. He's the third Muslim, in case you're wondering. Mashallah. Yeah, thank you for having me. Jazakallah khairan. May Allah bless you guys. Uh, oh, yeah. Bless your viewers. Uh, keep us in your prayers, inshallah. I mean, inshallah, ya Rabb. And with that being said, Jazakallah khair, everyone who attended. Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa kina adhaab al-nar. And inshallah, we'll see you on the next one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi.